A lot of people have trust issues. I'm not talking about psychological trust issues that come from getting an oatmeal raisin cookie when you thought you were getting a chocolate chip cookie. I'm talking about legal trust issues. One of the trust issues people have is simply not having any trust at all. That's an issue because a proper trust can keep your estate out of probate. Probate could be a grueling process. The word probate in Old English means to prove, and that's basically what you have to do. You take down the last will and testament of John when he dies. You take it to the court. You have to prove that it is indeed his last will. Maybe he had another one. And then the court gives the teeth to that will that you could take it down to the bank once you've gone through the probate process and say, give this account to Henry, because that's what it says in the will. Just having a will doesn't protect you from probate. Your state has to prove that that will was your last will and not the some 30 wills that uh, Howard Hughes had when he died. One of the things that happens during the probate process is there's going to be lawyer fees and court fees. Something else that happens as part of the probate process is notices are sent to all the creditors of the estate. And sometimes an advertisement is even put in the newspaper. So this is a very public process. They want to make sure that all the creditors of this estate, of this person that died, let's call him John, they want to make sure that all these creditors are satisfied. That's one reason to have a trust is it keeps you from having to prove the last will and testament. Because the trust distributes the property, it keeps things liquid, because during this probate process, everything's locked up. Bank accounts can't be drafted upon. There's nothing that can be taken from the state, exchanged, or anything until everything is proven. And that could be a long process. For Howard Hughes, his estate didn't close for, I think it was over 34 years. It didn't close till 2010. Another example of trust and probates is closer to home. It was my own aunt. She passed in 2020, and she made all her nieces and nephews beneficiaries of her trust. So my other aunt, who was the trustee, expected this to be a very quick process of just distributing the funds in the trust. But it turned out that my aunt had many things that were not in her trust, and these things she also wanted distributed to her nieces and nephews. So the trust process would have been very quick to distribute, but all the items that had to go through probate lengthened that process. And many times what might happen is that things have to be sold off that are in this state to start paying taxes that are coming due. If the heirs aren't left with funds to take care of those taxes, then things have to be sold at a fire sale to make sure they get taken care of. You mentioned that the assets that were not in the trust was the reason that they had to be they had to go through the court, the probate process. And that's important because a living revocable trust can help to avoid probate. And the reason is is because the trust is the owner of those assets before you die. So Let's say you have a bank account that's in the trust. Well, the bank has a copy of that trust on file, so they know it's a legitimate document. You gave it to them before you, you died. And so the bank sees, oh, yep, so-and-so is next in line to be the trustee. It's a much easier transfer process. They don't have to go through the whole court system as long as the assets are put into the trust before the person dies. And there were a lot of attorney actions involved. And so all of that comes with fees. And there were 12 nieces and nephews that were the beneficiaries of this trust. So every time an action was taken, a letter had to be drafted. The trustee's name was signed at the bottom, but it was sent by the attorneys and it was sent out to all 12. And then oftentimes we had to sign a document and return it and all that post. Everything came out of that trust. This leads to problems if things are not put in a trust that is going to protect those assets because those expenses that you're talking about, Michelle, they all came out of the inheritance before it was able to pass. Any stocks or bonds or anything that were in the market that weren't in the trust, guess what? They're still subject to market fluctuations and volatility. That's exactly what happened in this case. The trustee, who was also a relative, told me that she was just sick to see 
the value of things that my aunt had not had in the trust uh, just plummet during the time that probate was happening. She couldn't do anything with them because they weren't in the trust. Exactly. She couldn't do anything. Nothing could be moved, and she just saw the value plummet. So trust can be a very good thing to have. It protects your estate, what you want to leave, the people that you love, the foundations that you care for, the charities that you support with as much of your estate as possible without the government coming in and taking their hunk or attorneys coming in and taking their hunk and then whatever's left falls to the people that you really care about. It keeps things much more private. It streamlines the transfer process and lets you keep as much of that within the family as possible instead of broadcasting the affair to the whole world. There's a lot of different kinds of trusts, though, and we need to be very knowledgeable and understand what these trusts stands for. Otherwise, we can kind of get hooked up into, oh, do I need this kind of trust, or I do need this kind of trust, or maybe a charitable remainder trust, or maybe an irrevocable life insurance trust, or maybe an irrevocable trust, or maybe a slat trust. I mean, there are so many different kinds of trusts that we need to have the proper knowledge and we need to have the understanding so that we're not getting hoodwinked into a trust that's not going to benefit us at all. Okay, but right here, I feel like we need a disclaimer. We are not trust specialists. We are not attorneys. We do not provide legal advice. We're talking about trust in a general sense. There's a lot of information that you can read about a trust, but if someone is pressuring you to make a trust and they're going to be able to do everything for you, you need to check out the reasons why you may or may not need a trust and what kind of trust you need. There's a lot of information out there. Be careful where you're getting your information so you're getting accurate information. And one of the reasons we're talking about this is recently someone said, if you are going to purchase a whole life policy for infinite banking, you have to have a trust. And that is not true. You do not need a trust if you have a whole life insurance policy. If your situation benefits from having a trust, you can name the trust as the beneficiary of your policy, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yesterday, we were visiting one of our life insurance headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we were talking to the underwriter. And many times people ask us, can I buy an insurance policy on my aging parent? Because I'm taking care of them and it's costing me money and I would like to be able to recoup that. And there's an insurable interest problem there that the insurance companies, because of certain state laws, just don't want to do that. And so the underwriter said that's where a trust would make it feasible and for us as an underwriter to say, yeah, this makes sense. Let's set up a trust that owns this policy so that it is legally determined where those funds are going to go and someone's not going to be tempted to bump someone off just to get the death benefit. That's where we come in as the life insurance experts to look at your parent. How old are they? What is their health condition? Does it make sense to purchase a life insurance policy on them at their age? It may, but it may not. And that's where we can come in and help you decide, is that even going to be a financial benefit to you? When we're talking about avoiding probate, it's the living revocable trust is usually the trust that most people are going to use during their lifetimes because the trust is just kind of a pass-through entity. It's there, but you're still the one filing the tax returns. You're still the one that controls and manages the assets, and that's what you want in most cases because you're, you're alive. You, you want to be able to control your property. If you put it in an irrevocable trust, now it's much more difficult to change anything about that. So a living revocable trust can help to avoid the probate process when it is used correctly. It can also help to avoid estate taxes. For example, uh, the federal estate taxes, a lot of people aren't going to pay the federal estate taxes because the first 13.61 million, I think it is this year, is tax-free for for estate tax purposes. And they don't call it tax-free, it's an exemption amount. So technically it is tax, but you don't pay anything on the first 13.61 13.61 million. But by the time you get to $15 million estate, you're in the 40% federal estate tax bracket. Some states have lower brackets than that. So Oregon, for example, their, their estate tax kicks in at $1 million. 
So if your estate is over $1 million, then you're going to be paying 10% estate tax, and the organs rate goes all the way up to 16%. So if you have a $12 million estate, you'll be in the top tax uh, state tax bracket in Oregon as well. So a living revocable trust can help to avoid some of those taxes by allowing both spouses to pass a million dollars instead of one spouse leaving their estate to the other and then the second spouse passing a bigger estate that would, would be subject to estate taxes. After the break, we're going to talk about more trust issues and the IRS warnings about what you should know before you start a trust. The policy that works best for the infinite banking concept is a dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a paid up additions rider. You'll want this policy to be structured to allow the maximum cash value accumulation without creating unnecessary tax consequences or inhibiting the cash value growth for future policy years. At McPhee Insurance, we specialize in these types of policies. We are licensed in all 50 states, so no matter where you're located in the U.S., we can help you. Call our office at 702-660-7000 or email us, team at mcpheeinsurance.com. During the break, we were talking about all our new subscribers on Wealth Talks, and if you haven't subscribed, we encourage you to do that. But we were also talking about the abusive trust tax evasion schemes that are so popular today in marketing. Trusts are often part of a tax evasion scheme or some sort of legal setup because the professional costs to set those up are high. It's very important to understand that all of these schemes have certain themes that are stressed, like, oh... This is so new that your, your, your tax preparer doesn't even know about it. Or this is something the IRS doesn't want you to know. Or, oh, you're never going to have to pay income tax again if you set up this kind of trust. Oftentimes the people promoting these say, I don't pay any taxes. Why should you? And you're left to feel like if you don't grab onto this idea of I'm not going to have to pay taxes, then you're kind of a fool. The fact is, a lot of the promoters do pay taxes, and they're just not talking about that. A trust does not necessarily keep you from having to pay income tax. In publication 3995 by the IRS, it says that a trust won't keep you from having to report income for tax purposes. In fact, trusts pay some of the highest income tax rates uh, possible with a very low tax bracket. If you make $16,000 at a trust, that would be a trust filing its own tax return, then the trust is going to be in the 37% tax bracket for that income. If it's capital gains income, then they're in the 20% tax bracket for the capital gains if the trust is making $16,000 a year. So that's a false premise that you're never going to have to pay taxes again. Yes, your trust might have to pay them, but who really owns the trust? I mean, maybe your trust is writing the check under that name, but you're the one that's losing that money. People could really tie themselves in knots when they're using irrevocable trusts to try and avoid taxes because not only is the trust going to have to pay those taxes, your control over the assets that are controlled by the trust is now minimal. Sometimes we hear people being told that if you set up this trust, you can now deduct personal expenses that you normally couldn't have deducted as just an individual paying taxes. And that's false too. A trust does not, is not a business. It doesn't set up an entity where you get to deduct certain things personally that some businesses allow you to do. In fact, is the IRS is going to try to prove why that trust was there. What was the intent and purpose of it? And if it was to avoid taxes on personal expenses, they're going to tax you anyway with a fine. The IRS has put out some publications specifically as they are going after abusive trust schemes. These schemes are both domestic and foreign, involving foreign assets and domestic assets. And so it doesn't doesn't matter what type of trust, if you're trying to avoid taxes with it, then the IRS is going to be looking at that very closely. There's a lot of different kinds of trusts. And like you said earlier, John, it's the the revocable living trust that most people that we're talking to today are probably going to want to investigate further. Sometimes we've seen people put life insurance into an irrevocable life insurance trust as well. That's usually for people that have large estates that are going to be subject to estate taxes in some way. They'll put a life insurance policy that they don't need to take a policy loan on. They'll put that into an irrevocable life insurance trust. And then that gets it out of their estate 
after, I think it's a three-year look-back period. And that could be a way that they can give the death benefit on that life insurance policy uh, to their heirs without it being a part of their estate tax exemption. Michelle, do you remember Susie that called us a couple of years back and was being um, marketed to set up a SLAT, a Spousal Limited Access Trust? Although that's a legitimate form of protecting income for a spouse, uh, they were also being said, well, you really need to set this trust up in some Caribbean island. And when we ran it by the attorneys, they said, stay away with a, with a 10-foot pole. This is a tax scheme. Yes, and the insurance companies, you know, they hear these things all the time. Uh, the schemers come up in different forms. They say different things at different times, but it all has that same underlying tone. We're going to get it offshore. We're, you're going to avoid taxes. You're, and we really have to watch our own motive here. Yes, we want to avoid as much tax as possible, but we still have to pay our taxes. We have to be honest. And we have to be careful that we don't get sucked into some scheme that is illegal. A lot of people get pulled into tax schemes because they want it to be true. Not necessarily because they're going in and evaluating everything with a logical mindset. Sometimes things sound too good to be true. If they can be explained and you can think about it logically and it makes sense, it might be true. But... If it can't be discussed and explained and shown to be true, be careful. And one last thing that's very important. If you pay an attorney to set up your trust, make sure it's funded. Unfunded trusts are a worthless piece of paper because just like Michelle's aunt, if it's not in the trust, it's gone to probate. With all the different types of trusts out there, you want to be sure that you get what you think you're getting when you get a trust to solve a specific issue. Don't get an oatmeal raisin cookie when you think you're getting a chocolate chip cookie. You want to know enough to understand the difference between those and make sure that you know how to use the trust that you're getting. That's just not going to be oh, an extra piece of paper that you pay a lot of money for. John, I know someone who cannot balance their own checkbook, and yet they work at a local credit union and personal services, and she helps balance customers' checkbooks and balance their checking accounts and their credit card accounts because it's a, at an arm's length distance. She has no emotional attachment to that. And that's what a trust can help people do is set their finances over here in a third party, this separate entity, and now they're managing it at arm's length, and it's not so emotional for them. There are many legal tools available that provide specific benefits in specific situations. Many of the legal tools used by the wealthiest people were created to provide the rich an exception to the rules. You don't have to be extremely rich to use and benefit from some legal tools, but just because the tools are there doesn't mean you should use them. Having a knowledge about what tools are available can be very helpful, but understanding what tools you need becomes the underlying issue here. Just because something is available doesn't mean that you will benefit from it. And sometimes trying to apply tools that were for some other purpose will end up costing you big time. People are concerned about the devaluation of the American dollar. Our client Brian wrote in and said people are frequently asking him about gold, crypto, and participating whole life insurance. Brian has asked us to take up these subjects, which we're going to do next week right here on Wealth Talks.